Welcome to the Real Estate of Things podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Elliott. Dan, thank you for joining. Yeah, it's great to be here, Dalton. For sure. So you run, uh, you and a partner, you run SESA Properties, which is really a niche cash home buying company based in Ohio. Uh, really eager. You and I got on a call a couple weeks ago and, um, you know, you, you, you effectively kind of wrote the pre-interview outline for me. You very succinctly walked through your business model, uh, really unique, a great approach you all have, uh, really Ohio. And I think a little bit of, uh, Florida as well. Your, you know, company is based in Ohio. You are in, uh, Florida yourself, yeah, right? South Florida down here. Uh, we don't do too much in terms of the actual company in the Florida market, um, myself in terms of a, a personal portfolio with my wife as well. Um, but we're mainly focused on the, uh, the Cleveland, Ohio and the, the secondary markets kind of around that area. Beautiful. And and if I if I throw out an OH Ohio. Nice. There we go. Beautiful. Uh so let's let's jump right into it. I want you to describe your company and what you do. And that's gonna tee our conversation up for something I always find really interesting, which is where someone goes off the beaten path. So you think just through the lens of investing. Right? A lot of people kind of the if you looked at the top of funnel for investing, you're talking about money that isn't just sitting in a check and savings money market account. You know, people will chuck money into a 401k and then IRA and then a overflow goes into a brokerage account. It's probably a normal step. Then you have real estate investors, right? Real estate is, uh, is and has been one of the biggest generators of wealth in the history of the world. Uh, if you want to become a millionaire, the real estate, statistically speaking, purely statistically speaking, that's going to be the best way uh, to generate uh, true wealth. Now, within the confines of my day job, right, where I work on a nationwide lender, we finance uh, fix and flips, rental properties, multifamily, new construction, uh, kind of a wide strat, chiefly that one to four product, one to four unit product. Now, your firm is really a, a niche within a niche, uh, I think. So walk me through, say, some properties. Uh, how long have y'all been around? What's your real competitive advantage? Yeah, so just a little bit about the uh, the company itself. So say, some properties was founded by myself and my partner, uh, Vince Zanoskis, uh, which is actually local to, or uh, born and raised within the, the Cleveland market. So I actually, um, I started out as a personal, one of those uh, those top level investors. So I had a portfolio. Um, I think I bought my first house when I was 26 with my wife and we did a couple uh, live-in flips. Uh, so for three properties. And then I really started, uh, you know, going out there and doing a lot of real estate investing. So traditional real estate investing on the MLS market, um, bought a portfolio and specifically looked uh, in the Cleveland market just because of the economics coming from at that time I was in the Boston area where uh, prices of houses were so expensive. Um, and essentially, you know, built up a uh, portfolio of, uh, you know, single family and small multifamily properties within the Cleveland area. Um, and the one individual that I kind of work with a lot in, in that um, in that space was my partner, Vince. Um, and we started working together in terms of investment. Um, and then we came up with the idea that we were going to start uh, wholesaling properties just to make some quick uh, cash flow. Um, and essentially, uh, we started out the company, we founded it in, I think, uh, 2018, about mid-2018, so still relatively a, a pretty young company. Um, we started out 100% uh, as a wholesale company, right? So we were doing wholesaling, direct marketing, uh, mainly at that time through um, postcards, um, actually 100% exclusively through postcards, direct to seller. Um, and we picked up a, a lot of properties um, and, and that's how we kind of started our company. Um, over the year or two after that, we kind of merged into, um, changed the strategy of the company to actually uh, still do a lot of that, uh, the direct to market, um, direct to seller marketing that we were doing. So that's how we get all of our properties. We're not buying anything on the MLS. And essentially, we're, we're going out, we're finding uh, sellers, um, you know, talking to them, uh, negotiating with them and actually purchasing properties directly through them with no realtors involved. Um, and then mm. we now today we are actually closing on those properties, doing light rehabs on them and selling them on market. So we'll buy everything off market for cash. 
um, or light cash, uh, you know, funds. And then we will actually do light rehab, um, enough rehab that it's going to add value to it. So we're very strategic about what we do to the properties. We're not doing, you know, full blown down to the studs. We're doing, um, you know, renovations and repairs and updates that we think are going to add the most value to those properties. Um, and then we are quickly turning them, um, and, and listing them through uh, Vince, who is also a realtor, which is is very good for the the company. And we're selling those properties back on market as well for uh, quite a hefty profit. So that that's kind of the business model now. Um, you know, off market mm-hmm. acquisition, light, um, you know, retail, not retail, but light uh, rehab and renovations, and then we're selling it on market uh, to market buyers. So it's kind of the the full cycle of the uh, the market and how we acquire and actually sell those properties. Got it. I, I want to pick your brain on the marketing side of the fence because especially since you're not utilizing MLS, uh, it sounds to me that marketing is the lifeblood of the machine. Uh, but you said one thing that really intrigued me. You said you did three live-in yes. flips. Yeah. So I, I did How? those uh, much to the dismay of my wife and uh, we didn't have any kids uh, for the majority of those. So they were a little easier I would say, though, though, you know, those are um, same same type of uh, model, same type of mindset. We tried to find houses that were undervalued. Maybe they were on the market for a little too long. We got them you know, grossly under what the market value should have been. We did um, a couple of them were heavier, but, uh, you know, some of them were just minor um, renovations and updates. And then the, by the time that we sold them within two to three years, um, made significant amounts of profit that we kind of rolled into the next one. And we've done that three times. Um, and now we're currently living in a live and flip duplex down here in Florida, um, which we've actually done the same thing. And the, uh, the value of that uh, corresponding with the, the market shift uh, from the COVID um, has uh, nicely uh, you know, increased the equity that we have in this property. So definitely, uh, it's, it, it's almost like a, uh, an investing side hustle, right, that we're doing as I'm doing these other real estate investing uh, endeavors. So definitely a, a good thing to do there. You, my friend, are you, you live and breathe real estate investing. I, I think that is a testament to the fact that you just take this to a whole different level. I could not imagine when I, I bought my kind of first current and only house uh, in 2017, January 2017. And I had a buddy of mine at the time. Uh, he and his dad, very much kind of hands on, handyman type. Uh, skill set. And, you know, he, he showed me the house he was getting had under contract and it was very much uh, uh, buy it to then rehab it and improve yep. it. And, you know, fast forward today, gorgeous house. He's, he's kind of just finished. The last thing was redoing the master bathroom and they just wrapped that up. Um, and, and so now finished product a few years later, absolutely gorgeous and love it at the time. And even today, I'm like, you're an absolute lunatic. When I was looking to get a house, I was like, I want to sign, get the money wired over and, and move stuff in. So uh, you, I, I, it, it blows my mind. The uh, What was the most frustrating thing? Or I guess what is the most frustrating thing about that process? Is there something that just doesn't get any better every time you do um, it it's tough when you're living in it right because if you're doing major components of the house the bathrooms especially on the first one i think it was a one bathroom right so we were trying to live there and taking showers at work and stuff like that so that was fun but yeah it, it's 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 just not you know most people like you just said they want a house that they can kind of sign and move into and have everything ready maybe minor repairs things like that but uh, we always look at it yeah. as, as an investment and a way to you know grow the equity in the house. So I think that that kind of gets you through it. But it is very uh, it's frustrating as you're going through it. You don't have a kitchen for maybe a month or so at a time or a bathroom. Um, you're down a bathroom, especially now with kids. It's a little tougher. Right. But um, so I don't know if we're going to be doing that too much longer. We got two little ones now, so it's a little tougher. I'm going to go ahead. We're going to, we're going to get an award made. You are the truest real estate investor in the world. I, I, you're a humble guy. I could tell, uh, you, you take it to the next level. This is crazy. Uh, flipping over to the business side of the fence, you know, not using MLS. That's, 
uh, that's another kind of step down in the funnel that is just unique, a different approach, a different strategy. So before we get into the marketing side of the fence, like what, what drives you all to just throw out what is really a, a primary lifeline in the real estate industry and say, nah, we're going to, we're going to do it a different way. Yeah. And I think it, it does take a certain um, individual or a certain company to kind of go the off route, uh, off market route. Um, I mean, the, the MLS definitely is a good place to find properties. I, I would say that, you know, obviously it's where the majority of people find their properties. Um, but the, uh, and I should say too, back in the day, I mean, that's where we've always found the houses that we live in personally. That's where I've, uh, I've bought a lot of the properties that, um, you know, in, in my personal portfolio before we started doing the, the SESA stuff. Um, but my problem with it is, number one, I, I feel like, you know, the, the prices are too high, um, at least for what I want to pay for it. Um, number one. And then number two, just the, the number of eyes that you have on a property, right? You can think, I don't know what the statistics are, but how many people look at Zillow? How many people have the MLS feeds from realtors? Um, so the, the level of competition that you're going up against uh, for that one specific house or maybe that, that handful of houses that you're interested in um, is significantly higher than when you're, uh, you know, targeting specific houses that are off market and not listed. So I think that that's kind of where the mindset comes in. Um, you know, number one, I think it, it it's the profit side of it, right? So we look to purchase houses anywhere from, you know, 40 to 60% of market value. Um, and you're not going to get that in most markets if, you know, ever um, on the MLS market, right? So we see some properties right. in Cleveland, um, people actually will list properties for, you know, $20,000 where it's a $60,000 house, but it's a full rehab. Um, but even in a market like that, where it's so investor heavy, it, it is rare to see those houses there, right? So we, um, we take the approach that we want to reach out directly to sellers. Um, and, and there is a, a lot of benefits that the sellers get out of selling for cash. Obviously, they're selling for less money, but there is a certain convenience and you know, timing and, and other benefits that they're getting out of it. Um, so we we like to hit those those sellers directly and, and kind of cut out the middleman. Um, and even though Vince, uh, my partner, is a, a realtor, he doesn't act in that form or fashion. We act as you know, SESA, the the cash house buying company, versus um, him going in there and trying to buy it as a realtor or listed for them as a realtor. Yeah, so that makes sense. And the trade off on your end, right? The the person who's selling the home, the trade off is take a little less cash, more convenience, and quicker, right? And on your end, you are able to hunt for more advantageous deals, but the trade off is you have to do more of the legwork. So you mentioned direct mail earlier, and you know I've been in this space uh, close to seven years, and direct mail is still a thing and it sounds like it is still a successful thing on your end right yeah so direct mail is an interesting one um we used to do primarily direct, direct mail when we started um the thing i'll say about direct mail uh the the hit rate is relatively low on it so we see anywhere from like one to two percent would be a, a good return um, depending on the list and, and everything else that we're trying to do. But essentially you have, um, you know, you have people that get these things in the mail, right? And you think of most people that get junk mail in the mail. What's the first thing you do? If you even look at it, never mind, read it, it's in the trash, right? So if you have someone that's actually looking at these things, um, never mind taking and making the effort to actually pick up a phone and give us a call, uh, most of the time leaving a message. That takes a lot of effort, right? So what that shows you is that the people that we actually get as leads from the postcards are actually high quality leads, people that are actually motivated to sell their homes. Um, you know, if yeah. it makes sense for them, if it makes sense for us, then I think it's a good opportunity for us to move forward, but definitely a, a high quality lead that's coming in. Um, we've seen in the past, we've tried, you know, tested and tried. We do a lot of like a, a lot of hypothesis testing and testing for different marketing strategies and things of that nature. Um, the two highest quality lead sources that we have, number one is our website. So a lot of organic and digital marketing that we do. 
Um, and the other one is the the postcards. Uh, and the postcards, we've kind of, you know, advanced that. So obviously we use the the typical or traditional sense of getting lists and we we make those lists or we purchase those lists or have someone else do it. And then we send those out to, you know, it's kind of like the uh, the shotgun approach, right? You're hoping you're get, getting a couple leads out of that. Um, the other one is it, it's really around like the uh, the driving for dollars or, or scouting, right? So my partner, Vince, he's a, a realtor. He's always around the market driving around. We have other individuals on our team that we work with, um, always driving around the market as well, looking for houses that that might be a fit. So it's the whole driving for dollars things. We'll note those addresses down and then actually send postcards to those houses. So we've got uh, quite a few leads and, and, and opportunities that way as well. So those are the, the two main um, channels for uh, the direct mail that we're doing. But, you know, they, the, the website one is a, it's a big one. And that's obviously we have content out there. We, we create content and, and people um, searching for very specific terms and have very specific questions. will find that content. Um, learn about the company, kind of go through the the buyer's journey and actually um, reach out to us. So most of the leads that we're getting now um, are from those two sources, uh, definitely the the two highest quality sources of leads that we have. Um, and we've done quite a, a good job with our website lately and organic um, leads coming in as well. So um, anytime that you can kind of sit back and let the website do the, the, the work for you is, is definitely a good thing for sure. Absolutely. And, and a lot of the business or most of the business really is in Ohio. I was just in Ohio for the first time ever last week. I was up there for a conference uh, for three or four days and it was in Cleveland, a beautiful city. We were at the Huntington Convention Center, I think, which is they opened up the blinds in the ballroom, uh, like floor to ceiling, and you just had the Brown Stadium right there. Uh, which is also a unique thing. Usually, my sister's in Dallas. I'm a Cowboys fan, but to get to the stadium, it's like a half hour, 45 minute trek west outside. So it was pretty cool to see, you know, Cleveland Brown Stadium in Cleveland. Uh, so pretty cool. But how's the Cleveland market doing? It sounds like, uh, at least through the lens of what you all are doing, it's on fire. Yeah, you know, I, I think similar to a lot of other markets from the COVID, the lack of inventory, um, you know, the market's kind of caught fire in the last year plus. Um, you know, according to everything that we've seen, it's kind of cooled down a little bit or leveled down a little bit compared to, you know, the heart of the, the COVID um, kind of pandemic. Um, but surely, I mean, uh, the, the market there is still rather hot. The, the value of prices of the houses have grown. I think that the stat that I saw um, last week was about 25% year over year. Um, and, and really where it kind of speaks volume is five-year mark. I think it's around 91% value growth um, for the, the the home values there. So I, when I started investing in Cleveland, it was about five years ago. And I mean, the, the prices mm -hmm. of the properties were dirt cheap. And I think I mentioned this before, but I was up in the, uh, in the Boston Northeast area. Um, you know, looking at houses there, uh, single families, duplexes, you know, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 plus. Um, and, and it was absolutely ridiculous, even though I was uh, making really good money at that point. Still, I mean, to, to put my entire savings into one property was kind of hard to swallow. Um, so I started looking yeah. at, you know, it, other markets uh, and, and doing the whole remote thing. And Cleveland really stood out there because of the price of the, the property, number one. Um, number two, the uh, the strong rental demand there. I think the um, the numbers around 50, 51 percent of the uh, the population or the housing units are actually rentals. So a very very strong yeah. rental market uh, for investors there. And then the other thing is just the uh, the, the price and the value, right? So I, I was buying houses anywhere from like forty to fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, five years ago or four years ago, whatever it was. Uh, and the rents were around like nine hundred to eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars. So I mean, the the return that you're actually getting for the properties there um, at that time was astronomical. Right now, it, it, it's it's changed a little bit. The uh, the values of the the houses have obviously gone up quite a bit in that time period, but uh, the rental market yeah. and the rental rates have also gone up as well. So uh, we look at Cleveland, and I've always looked at it as. You know, one of those strong markets, undervalued markets, even with the, the recent growth that it's seen, um, still very affordable. Um, and that's why we're actually seeing a lot of investors from uh, the two coasts. So you have the, the Northeast um, coast coming over from New York and the Boston area, and then obviously from the West Coast as well. 
um, as well as a lot of international investment, um, Israel, Russia. I mean, there's a lot of different investors from a lot of different places that have, you know, kind of come awake to the Cleveland market because of the economics and the returns that you're you're seeing there. Um, and mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, coupled with a lot of other things, the economy is growing strong. There's a lot of uh, kind of the, the one knock on Cleveland is the, the pop population decline. But I think it's actually a, a top 10 uh, market in terms of growth of millennials actually coming in. So educated millennials. Um, so, you know, couple that with the the economy and the growing commerce there, um, the influx of highly educated, you know, wealthy for their age millennials. And I think the uh, the future of Cleveland is very strong. Um, you know, a lot of strong industries there, a lot of strong things going for it. And it just seems like, you know, over the next five years that that growth should continue. Um, and I would assume eventually the prices are going to get up, you know, a little bit more normal for what they were post uh, post Great Recession, but um, still mm -hmm. a, a very, you know, greatly valued market that I think a lot of people could play in for sure. Yeah, you mentioned millennials there and the, the headline as it relates to our industry and millennials is always, you know, they want to rent, they don't want to buy, uh, which I think is is overblown a little bit. Uh, but nonetheless, there definitely is a, a trend towards that. So do you think that the millennial percentage increase in Cleveland is going to bring that you know, 50, 51% rental rate materially up? Or do you think it's, it's not going to have a material shift on it? Um, I, I mean, to that, I, I really don't know. But yeah, if that, if that trend is correct in the millennials, um, I, I think the thing is the affordability, right? The, the thing that might throw it off a little bit is yeah. that the market there is more affordable, but still, um, it seems like there is a tendency for millennials to rent versus buy. So especially if the prices keep coming up, I think that will hold true. Um, Cleveland has been traditionally a high, you know, percentage of rental, um, for the uh, the housing units there, so I, I think that will uh, it will stay the same at the very least, if not uh, grow with the millennials kind of influx there. Yeah, that, that note about value makes a lot of sense. How that could help kind of askew the norm or the the kind of headline there of uh, millennials equal rent if there just continues to be you know better than average value when you compare it to other MSAs that could move people out of renting and into to ownership. And, you know, your strategy, very hands-on, very, uh, yeah, just very hands-on. So you're able to find value. Uh, you know, is there, you know, are there a lot of ways outside of what you're doing in the direct marketing world uh, to really find value? I mean, I, I feel like MLS, you know, if you're scouting there, like you said, you're fighting against, uh, countless people on every single property right now. It, it just seems like the ability to get solid yield uh, continues to be hampered by the ultra competitive nature. Uh, any any insider thoughts around you know how you as an investor can get value in this crazy market? Yeah, so I think there's there's kind of a I don't know if you want to call it kind of a layered approach, right? So at the very top, it's it's high convenience, maybe lower effort. And, and don't take me wrong. I think even if you're buying on the MLS, you still have to do the proper analysis. And there's a lot of work that goes in, into the due diligence, et cetera, in buying a property, regardless of where you're buying it. Um, let's say at the top, mm -hmm. there's the MLS buyers. And then at the bottom, it, it's companies like ours that are doing a lot of that. It is very hands-on. I agree with you. Uh, it's a lot of marketing. It's a lot of effort to get those deals. And yes, we get them for a good discount. And yes, we're making a lot of profit off them. But there is a lot of um, effort and uh, marketing dollars that go into getting those deals as well. So the MLS, uh, the cash buyers, and then in between, you have the, the wholesalers, right? So if you're looking to buy off market, but you're not looking to essentially do that nitty gritty marketing and the, the full hands-on marketing approach to it, um, there are plenty of off market sellers out there, uh, most likely wholesalers that are actually doing a lot of that work um, to get those properties and then assigning contracts. So if you're looking for, you know, you want to get away from the MLS, but you don't want to do the marketing yourself. I think the, uh, the off market wholesalers and actually getting on, you know, the list and finding those wholesalers that you trust is a good way to get properties, um, you know, under market value. 
maybe a little bit more than you would if you were doing the direct marketing yourself, obviously, because they need to make some money as well. But definitely going to be getting properties uh, for less money than you would be getting them on the MLS. So that that's a good place to look. Um, the only caveat I put out there. So if you're looking for a house that needs, you know, very minimal um, repairs or no repairs at all, I think you're, you're probably going to be up in that MLS range. Um, but if you're willing to put a little bit of work into it to get a good deal um, and build a little bit more equity than if you were buying it on the MLS and trying to time it correctly, um, then, you know, looking for those off market wholesalers, getting on the list, um, that, that's a good place to find some deals as well. And and nowadays with you know facebook and, and all the other groups out there i think it's it's pretty easy to um to find the wholesalers and get on their list so you don't really have to do anything and it almost becomes the point where you know like from a, a realtor you're getting the mls feeds right in your email uh it's almost the same thing with the wholesale properties as well um the other caveat that I'll put out there for off-market properties is it's a cash world, right? So cash is king and off-market. Um, these sellers are willing to sell their properties for, you know, a big discount, right? But they're looking to cash for mm -hmm. it. They're not looking for someone to go through the um, the application process. They're not looking for someone to take months uh, going through like a conventional or FHA uh, mortgage application process. And, th and that's one of the reasons why we get these deals so good. Um, but I would say if you're looking to buy off market, um, you're going to have to buy in cash. You're going to have to buy in private money or you're going to have to buy like you guys do. A perfect example to kind of lead into uh, into Lima is the uh, the hard money. Right. So a lot of our buyers, uh, when we were doing wholesaling, uh, were either using cash or hard money loans. Um, some of them were using, you know, funds and, and other things of that nature. But I mean, you have to have some way to get money quickly, um, which is why hard money loans and, you know, even cash in a market like Cleveland, you could theoretically do it all in cash if you had enough cash in your bank account. Um, but you have to have some yeah. way to actually purchase those properties quickly uh, in cash or cash like equivalents, essentially. Yeah, there has to be some benefit. There's no world where you just reap all the benefits yourself and you can't can't bring anything unique to the table. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Uh this, you know, the market we've talked about. Like Cleveland, you're in Southwest Florida. I'm in uh South Carolina. Uh you throw a stone, you're going to hit a red hot ironclad real estate market. Uh to my Happiness and joy. Uh, you know, you referenced Lima One. I'm kind of director of sales and customer experience here, and uh, so I, I look at stuff through the lending side of the fence, credit risk. Uh, that's my kind of uh, default mode in this space. And to my happiness, we haven't had you know a lot of craziness going on. At least that I've seen just through the lending side of the fence. We don't see a lot of folks doing. 100% LTV, uh, those types of wild, wild west things that were definitely more uh, pre-Great Recession. Uh, a lot of that got cold, yep. Yep. thankfully, uh, for the health of the American housing industry and really the global economy as a whole. Uh, so good position there. But is there anything going on right now in this space that you kind of wag your finger at like ah this just doesn't seem right or it seems too aggressive or uh just a an off-the-wall approach anything uh anything quirky going on um not so much quirky i i just i guess the uh the major caution that i have is to step back and and look at the the market prices i think everything's just kind of going a little haywire right now obviously some markets worse than others um you know, it, it really just look at it. Obviously, if you're going to be holding a property for a while, um, you can kind of ride out the cycle uh, buying high, then you can sell it high when the next cycle comes if you're willing to hold on to it. But um, it, I think that's the biggest thing, right? Like around the, the bubble, um, the last kind of big bubble that happened or at 2005, 2006, I think a lot of people were buying really high and then kind of the market crashed. So especially if you're in the... Um, in the short term, uh, you know, it's strategies with the, the fix and flips, like right now, we're going to have to start, you know, eventually, we're going to have to pay a lot more attention to the market, um, and, and make sure that the market isn't going to go down. Uh, thankfully, we kind of play in the, the four to six, maybe eight month um, time period. So it, it is pretty 
topic. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing a lot of the the larger renovations and rehabs, things like that, where you, you might be in it for a year, maybe a little bit more, um, a lot can change, uh, especially with a market that that's gone up so high. And I think just being careful of that and being cautious of it, um, that would be the biggest, you know, one thing that I would say, um, not that it, it's happened yet, but just to keep an eye out on that as the market starts to shift. I think some markets are starting to level out a little bit now. Um, inventory is still, you know, relatively across the board, pretty low. So I think the, uh, it's not going to crash. Like uh, some people are, are convinced it is. Um, so maybe that adds a little bit of safety there, but just a, a little bit of extra caution around, you know, some longer term projects as you're, as you're looking at them. Yeah, I think that's right. I, when I look at the kind of national housing market as a whole, the broad strokes piece for me is that we have really a multi-year housing shortage or housing deficit right, in terms of builds that need to come up to satiate demand. So that's a positive in that, you know, I don't think anybody's expecting the, you know, the floor to bottom out or fall out. Uh, but there are definitely going to be markets where when, when the U S housing industry normalizes, you're going to have some that continue to creep up a little bit and you're going to have some that, that do drop off a bit. So I think definitely sage advice that we're at a point now where we have been riding this ultra high for a minute and you know that, you know, the proverbial shoe is going to drop and that may mean just a normalization and yep. uh, no more huge spike ups or in some markets, it's going to mean a, a drop. And I think, I think the norm is going to be more uh, just calling of that insane HPA that's been going on more so than anything else. I think we just baked in, you know, got slightly ahead of uh, normal market times with appreciation, but uh, which has been good for some markets, the Greenville market that I'm in, I think, uh, you know, there's so much growth that's going on that home prices have finally called up to the city's growth. So I think we're at a, a good stable spot. Uh, but yeah, I think you got to watch yourself, make sure you're not getting overexposed. That's, that's how you hurt yourself in this space. Really. Right. It's just been overexposed, over leveraged. And then you find yourself in a quandary where you can't keep it all up long enough for the next cycle to come. Yep. Right. For sure. Yeah. So cool. Cool. So how much, one more question top of mind. Uh, you mentioned your time horizon on most properties is kind of that four to eight month range, uh, personally or through SESA or both. Uh, how much rental property exposure do you have? Is that part of the strategy? Um, yeah. So I think more on the personal side, I, I hold for rental property and uh, cash flow specifically. Um, on the SESA side, it, it's more of a short term play. Um, we will make a decision on each property, what we want to do with it, but typically we won't hold a property for more than, you know, about a year and a day. Um, the, the biggest benefit of that is the short term capital gains. Um, but most of those, uh, the properties that we're getting, we are acquiring them, um, you know, doing something if they're uh, rental properties specifically with the tenant, if we can. Um, and that might be keeping them in there. If it's good rent, it might be removing them if they're a problem, uh, tenant, et cetera. So we'll go through that process and then we'll start the renovations. Um, everything is, you know, quick, quick, quick. We try to get the properties um, turned over as quickly as possible um, and then put back on the market. And then we also price them aggressively. So we're not, you know, sitting on the market, uh, price them enough that we're, we're getting what we want for it, but not so high that, um, it's going to sit there and we're, we're just, you know, holding that property unnecessarily. So um, it, it really is a it's a strategic play and it's a strategic analysis on every property that we do have. But typically we're looking in that that four to six uh, month range from the time that we actually acquire the property, uh, take ownership and then actually sell it on market. Got it. Got it. I love it. A beautiful business model. Hey, if anybody's in, uh, you know, pretty much any primary, secondary, and even some tertiary markets in Ohio. How do they get in touch with SESA properties to see see what we can wheel and deal? Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the other things I should mention, we, do, um, we don't do wholesaling ourselves uh, or, or set out to do wholesaling, but we also 
do a lot of partnerships and JV partnerships with uh, wholesalers um, within the Cleveland market, as well as it would say other markets, right? So, uh, you know, remote wholesalers, things like that, that have acquired a property and they're looking to get rid of it, but they don't have that, that cash buyers network there. We'll also do a lot of, um, you know, deals with them and helping them move their property. So if you are in that boat, uh, we'd love to work with you uh, just to, to kind of pitch ourselves. But, um, you know, if yeah. anyone wants to check us out, you can certainly do so. Our website is sesabuyshouses.com. So it's S-E-S-A buyshouses.com. Um, or you can reach out to us. It's, it's uh, directly, it's 216-877-8430. If you want to give us a call, uh, that might be a bad idea, but uh, certainly uh, we'll love to hear from you. <laughs> No, I love it. I love it. Hey, Dan, thank you so much. Y'all have built uh, an incredibly unique uh, flywheel business and uh, I appreciate you sitting down and chatting with me. No worries. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Talk soon. See ya.